So for the video this week, um, I want to show you how I make my bracelets. I get a lot of comments about them. And um, I love making bracelets, and I make a ton of them. So uh, I'll just show you a, a couple of, that I've made here in the past. This one is um, uh, a stamped image. It's a stamp from Michaels, and colored with pan pastels, and then coated with uh, liquid clay. Um, so I really like that one. I want to show you just how flexible these bracelets are. They go on and off with no problem. I prefer using a magnet to keep them closed. Uh, polymer clay will warm up with your body heat and uh, gets a little bit uh, loose as, as you're wearing it throughout the day. So that just gives it a little bit of uh, security. Uh, my personal preference is to have not too big a gap here uh, on my wrist. So I've got one, one here. Uh, so that's just about an inch and a quarter or something like that. Um, any wider than that, uh, I, f I feel like it's uh, too much space to span and might want to try to come off, but this, this is about ideal for me. Um, the, this is the bracelet that I'm going to show today. So, um, I used to make them, let's start, start at the beginning. Here's a couple of other ones with a curved shape. And uh, this one is with the mica mash. Uh, clay. It's way thicker than I like to make them. Still a little bit flexible, but not uh, not a ton. So uh, my ideal thickness is uh, about five millimeters. Um, I, I don't measure as I go along. That's just what I'm aiming for. Uh, so here's one uh, done the same way that I did the um, Dragonstone uh, collar uh, tutorial that I did. I used uh, gold and copper uh, alcohol ink on it instead of uh, Inca gold, but uh, done the same way, and that's done on a curved surface. And uh, this is one done with uh, alcohol inks, um, as to the uh, the last tutorial I did on painting with uh, alcohol inks on baked clay, and then it's um, sealed with Cato um, uh, clay, and again. Very, very flexible. No problem putting it on and off. So uh, you make lots of choices when you're doing uh, bracelets. Sometimes you, you might have a, just a, a pretty scrap clay like this one, uh, which had kind of beachy colors and uh, I didn't want to do anything else to it, just showcase the clay. Sometimes you're going to use stamp. You might uh, do some painting on it or uh, uh, this this one was uh, just a simple bullseye cane. Let's see, if I'm a little bit off off camera here. And uh, on this one, I put a toggle, um, which uh, I like to use, but some people just find them awkward to use. But anyways, I like the the toggle. And uh, then my last couple of them have been um, uh, <laughs> little dragon. Uh, um, bracelets and I did those with uh, some um, eyes that I bought at Michael's uh, bead landing eyes and there's 12 in a package and they were all singles so you had to buy two packages to get a pair but um, but they're fun I mean I can paint the eyes myself but these these are actually quite nice and uh, so sometimes I just like using what I can find so that's uh, the little blue dragon and this one here is my first one that I did, a little bronze dragon. So uh, I really like them. And again, very, very flexible. No problem putting them on and off. So when clay is cured correctly, and cure it for a long time, uh, longer than what the manufacturers recommend, um, it's, it's very strong. Like I've been making them for about four years now, and I've never had one break. So what really helped me... Um, to make them, I'll sh well, first of all, I'll show you how I used to make them. So, uh, before I had a form to, to bake it on. This is um, an oval cutter, the largest one that came in a set. And I covered it with, uh, with a piece of paper. And then I just, uh, well, I won't get that back on. Anyways, and then I put my clay over top of, of the paper and then put another piece of paper around that side and then baked it like that. So you get an oval, let's take this one off here, you, you get an oval shape which um, mimics the shape of your wrist. 
um, the only problem with that is it fits sort of one size wrist. So if, if it happens to fit your wrist, I mean, that's great. And I made a ton of them that way. But then uh, I ordered a set of forms from uh, Teresa Salgalto at uh, tiny, tinypandora.com. And they're great. They're just an aluminum form. She has them in two sizes. She has them extra long. So if you have a larger wrist, uh, that's a great option. And um, there's the other one. Oops. So she's got one set that has a narrow, a medium, and the wide. And then she has uh, another set that has an even wider one if you want. Um, these are great. So that's what I'm going to show you how to use. I like this size just because I like to have a fair bit of surface on my, my uh, um, uh, bracelets. But um, the narrow ones are quite pretty too. So I use, I'll use those today. And this curve shape, and, and you can find metal ones like this in different jewelry stores and stuff like that. But uh, this one I bought at um, Shades of Clay in uh, Ontario, which is my favorite um, uh, supply, uh, polymer clay supply store. So uh, I love this shape. It's just so pretty when it's on. And uh, very little of the clay is in contact with your uh, wrists. So sometimes a problem you might have with the polymer clay is that um, your, your wrist will sweat because of, uh, you know, it's fairly close to the skin. And I like them close to the skin. Otherwise, they just kind of spin around or they just, you know, it, but that's just a personal personal taste. So so this one you've only got just the, the uh, middle section up against your wrist, so it's actually really quite comfortable to put on, or, or to keep on, I should say. So there's that. So I'm gonna I'll show you anyways how I do them and uh, um, why I like to use the magnets on it. Um, some people will make them without any closures at all. I just, I consider it a safety factor to have that because like I say, sometimes as your body warms it up and it gets a little loose, uh, you get it caught in your coat or something like that, um, it can open up. So anyways, that's, that's all that. So I've gone ahead now and I've prepared a bit of clay and uh, I rolled out this was done on a thickest setting of my pasta maker. And I put it through the machine with uh, this uh, piece of foam, which gives me um, just a really soft texture. Get that little piece of foam off there. So um, it's, uh, it's usually my strip is longer than my piece of foam. So I'll put it in like this and run it through the pasta machine and then uh, take it out and I'll flip the other side that's not textured and also run it through the pasta machine. And when, when it comes through the machine on the part that's already been textured, because it's thinner than the, uh, the number one thickness of, of your machine, it doesn't uh, change the uh, texture, so it, it keeps it intact. So um, it's nice to have that little bit of texture underneath. It um, also keeps... Um, uh, keeps your your hand from sweating so much up against it so the texture is comfortable to wear so anyways I've gone ahead oh and the other thing I forgot to mention the great great thing about the, uh, the bracelet forms at um, uh, tinypandora.com is that they come with uh, acrylic um, templates and uh, <laughs> these are just great I just absolutely love them so you'll get a template for each one of the um, bracelet forms so that when you cut your clay out, you know it's going to fit your form. So then I just went ahead and sort of cut, uh, uh, you know, wider than, than this for my first layer. Like I said, done on a number one and then textured. So now it's probably the thickness of a number two. And then my second layer, um, I'll put this one aside. My second layer is going to have my surface treatment on. So I rolled it on the second thickest setting, which is a number two. And for today, what I'm going to do is a, a core roller. Um, this is the one with the dragonflies, which I really love. Um, 
I bought my roller at um, uh, Van Island uh, on Etsy. That's uh, Diane uh, Bruce's uh, site. Okay, so I got my top layer here, and it's prepared uh, on a second thickest setting on my pasta machine. So on mine, it's a number two. And uh, I'm going to give it a quick little spritz of water. Don't need very much, but that'll act as a release. And then um, uh, some time ago, Ginger uh, at the Blue Bottle, Bottle Tree uh, did a great article on these core rollers. And she suggested using a rubber stamp to help you... Um, uh, make your impression. So that's what I'm going to use. So I'm going to stand up to do this and I'll put my roller on and then tr try to get as even a pressure as I can. should be enough there. So that thins out your layer quite a bit. So if you were doing something without uh, any any uh, pattern to it, you might try doing two layers at a number two, uh, the second thickness, to, to get a, a nice comfortable uh, width for your uh, for your bracelet. So now I'm going to put a piece of paper down and uh, use the uh, templates that come with the uh, tiny Pandora uh, bracelet kit. And I just want an idea how big it needs to be. So I'm going to cut off this section that doesn't have as good a imprint and just get rid of that. And now I'll bring both sections. So the textured bottom, put the texture down first. And the top piece on top of that. And then lay your, your pattern, your uh, template over top of that. And then I'll, go, I'll cut both layers at the same time. So for me, these templates are longer than they need to be. So if your pattern doesn't quite reach your length of your template, that's usually okay. Because I usually end up cutting off um, almost... Uh, an inch and a half anyways off of them. Okay, so that's my bracelet blank. And you can see about the thickness of it, so I'm happy with that thickness. And uh, I could spend a little bit of time smoothing that joint out. Sometimes when you cut both layers at the same time, you don't even have a little bit of a joint there, but um, that can be dealt with. So now it's time to color this. So what I really liked about this um, one that I did is uh, I find it looks like embossed copper. And uh, so the original green of the uh, bottom layer shows through slightly um, from the pan pastels. And um, I've used, uh, <laughs> used a lot of different colors on here. You, you make a whole lot of choices when you're uh, doing something. And so the more knowledge you have, the easier those choices become. So, um, like, I never really worry about if I don't really like what I started with, I just keep going until I do like it. So, on this one, I actually introduced a little bit of Inca Golds and stuff like that. And, 
and uh, sealed it with two layers of uh, Minwax polycrylic, which um, is really quite a nice finish. That's uh, this one. It's the uh, water-based one in the clear gloss. And um, so uh, on the f first one, I uh, coated it, let it dry. And then um, I wanted to bump up the colors a bit, so I put a little bit of the Inca gold in that kind of brown gold color. And, um, and then uh, put a second coat on, and then I baked it back in the oven at uh, 225 for probably about 35 minutes or something like that, um, which, which really helps make it a little harder and more durable. Uh, my preferred method is always Cato liquid clay, but, um, but this worked out really well for this. So um, I'd forgotten how much I liked the, uh, the Minwax polycrylic. So anyways, that's a great option. So for this one for today, I thought I'd use uh, metallic colors on it. And I have a, I have a SOFFT soft applicator, which is the Pan Pastel applicator. And I also have um, a makeup sponge, which I have to put it on pause to find. <laughs> Okay, there's my makeup sponge. Knocked it to the floor. So, uh, I, I mean, lots of different things you can do. I'm going to start off, since I'm kind of going to go for this sort of copper sort of color, um, I may as well start with some copper colored pan pastel. And I'll put it on the makeup sponge, and then I'm just going to skim over top of the dragonflies. So this one may end up looking a little different than the other one, and there's nothing wrong with that. So I like that color. Um, so why stop at one color? Maybe I'll try a little bit of the the uh, bronze pan pastel. And let's see what else we got. I've got um, kind of a sparkly black. That might be a bit much, but we'll try a little bit back in here. Oh, that's quite pretty, actually. So I'm not hitting every bit of the dragonflies because I want some of that copper to show through. That dark color is quite rich. And the other one I used just the plain black, which is probably, I may or may not, might not be necessary, but yeah, the black is nice too. So like I say, you just, you make a lot of choices uh, based on your experience. And uh, the only way to get experience is to uh, try things. Pan pastels are great. Um, you know I'm a big fan of them. You uh, just keep layering them. If uh, you feel like you've gone too far, you come back, put a little bit more copper on if that's what you want. Um, so you just keep layering them until you're really happy with them. So as I was doing this, I found that they looked best if they were dark, and then the, the lighter um, uh, base color will show. So that's good. So then after that, I always like to, to uh, take a piece of patty paper and just lightly burnish the um, pastels right into the, uh, uh, into the clay, and you'll get a a more permanent finish that way, although it still needs to be sealed. Okay, so now it's time to put it on the form. So the first thing I'm going to do is, uh, uh, my forms have a rounded edge, and I like that, so on one side, uh, I'll decide what's 
which side I want more of than the other. So I'm just going to trim off some of that edge. Just to round it off. And um, another thing I like to do is take that template and just come and sort of press in on an angle and just kind of round off that edge a little bit. You can do that also when it's on the form. But I find if I do it now, it, um, it's usually enough. just to soften that hard edge. And the other edge, we're going to do something with it after it's baked. So that's that's good. Now just make sure my hands are clean before I pick it up. Now because it's textured on this side, it's not going to want to stick to your form as well as, um, as it would if it wasn't textured. But uh, you can encourage it anyways to do that. So just put it on. Encourage it to come around. And then I'll put it down and I'll trim off the excess. Uh, I've done these enough on mine that I know that the length of the, um, the form is, is right for, for me and for most average size wrists. Uh, you can go past this area and uh, you'll, you'll get a little bit of a mark from the inside that'll show, but uh, it, that's an option also. So now I'm going to trim off these edges here. And then I'll just use my template to sort of soften that edge. And I'm going to color that edge also. So I'm going to take the uh, the sponge, put a little copper color on it. You could go dark. You could do whatever color you want. So uh, you don't have to use pan pastels on this. You could use Inca Gold. Um, you can use acrylic paint. You can put the acrylic paint on even when it's uh, uh, raw and it'll stick even better than if you do it after the fact but either way will work because you're going to seal it anyways um, so lots of choices doesn't have to be doesn't have to be pan pastels okay so that's enough of that and I have to clean my hands now okay so now the next thing I always do is uh, I'll put a hole um, to uh, to add my class it. So I'm going to use uh, one of these bootleg ferrules, but uh, a coffee stirrer straw or something will work. And um, just going to find the center and keep it back about an eighth of an inch or so from the edge. And then pull out that little piece of clay and do the same thing on the other side. And uh, after that's cured, I'll glue in an um, eyelet, uh, one of those little small eyelets that you can find at uh, Michael's in the scrapbooking section. So that works pretty good. Now the um, I have another one here. Um, when if you go on Teresa's site, uh, she makes a lot of great videos and. Uh, um, the way she does her uh, uh, bracelets is very similar to the way I'm doing my bracelets, so I don't know if I'm adding a whole lot to it. But uh, one thing that she does, uh, which is quite nice, is uh, she'll embed these, um, um, uh, I guess they're little bales. Hang on a second, I'll get one. So uh, I, I've got a big bag of them here that I bought at uh, Shades of Clay. And uh, so she'll embed those right, right in there, and then that gives you a place to uh, attach your jump ring and your clasp to. Uh, I don't use them 
a lot. Uh, I really like them though. They're very, very nice and professional looking. Sometimes my, uh, my bracelets aren't quite thick enough to, uh, to use them uh, without them showing. But um, anyways, I bought a whole bunch of them because I do plan on using them more often. So another option. So this is ready to be baked. So I'm just going to put it on a on a tile on my uh, uh, index card, just like that, and bake it. Uh, I like to bake it for at least a good hour. Um, don't bake it shorter than that. Uh, cover it with a, a piece of a tin, uh, like a baking sheet or something like that. And um, and you should have a really nice, strong, flexible bracelet when you're done. Uh, I forgot to tell you, this is Primo Clay. And uh, the color that I used here is uh, <laughs> basically scrap clay. So uh, it was a mix of greens and some blues and some whites and that type of thing. Um, so no, no real color that I can tell you. So we'll get that baked and then I'll show you how to assemble it into a bracelet and we're done. So I'll see you back when I'm all uh, when it's all baked. Bye. So my bracelet is out of the oven and it's still still quite hot. And um, I, I wanted to show you what my uh, setup is if I had decided to coat it with liquid clay. So I've kind of made this little homemade uh, clay. Um, um, I don't know what to call it, <laughs> but anyways, I would I leave the bracelet on the form, and and then I would put it on the um, um, toilet paper rolls that I have, and so I have it. Um, I I'll bulk it up with extra um, rolls that I've cut so that it it stays on there nice and rigid, and then I just use some. Uh, uh, paper towel rolls so that I can hold it as I'm using my heat gun and I can turn it and get all the edges and stuff like that. So the thing is to get this on here securely so that it doesn't move. I uh, find it easier to do that while it's still on the form. Uh, today though we're going to use the Minwax Polycrylic which is something like a Verithane and um, a nice finish so it's not necessary. So one of the things I'll, I'll do then right away, it's still very warm, very flexible. I'll take it off the form, comes off very easily. And um, this is where you can do a little bit of uh, sizing. So if you know you have a narrower wrist, you can hold it uh, a little bit closer. Uh, if I didn't have pastels on it, I could take that and then just plop it in some cold water and it would hold that shape. Uh, because I got pastels on there, sometimes what I'll do is I'll just take some some uh, paper and just kind of wrap it around and until it stays in that shape, and I'll let that let that cool. Um, conversely, if your wrist is bigger, you might want to spread it out a little bit. Uh, you might want to make it a little more oval if you prefer that shape. So you can do all kinds of things with this while it's still in this soft, uh, warm state, and then just let it cool to. Um, to the shape that you've chosen. So when this is cool, I'll be back and then I'll show you what we do next. So that's cool enough to work with now. So um, if you've got Preserve Your Memory spray, uh, it'd be a good idea to give it a, a coat of spray, even though you're going to use the uh, other types of varnish on, it will um, help keep, uh, keep the pan pastels in place. But uh, if you don't, then uh, when you coat it, you're going to use a nice wide brush and uh, um, don't overwork it. Just get that varnish on there and leave it be. But before we get to that, now that it's off the, um, the form and it's cool, this inner edge here is quite sharp and I find it uncomfortable. So that's where I'm going to use a, a scraper. Um, you could use a an exacto blade. Uh, I like I like a scraper, and I'm just gonna scrape off that edge, and it, it doesn't take long. If you had um, a bracelet, uh, say with cane slices or something like that, that you're uh, um, 
going to sand, you could sand that edge off, but scraping is faster. And now I'm doing the other side now. And it doesn't take much, but that it makes a big difference in the comfort of the uh, of the bracelet. If it gets a little hung up, lighten your pressure and and just work it a little bit more gently. Some, sometimes it sort of uh, tears rather than scrapes, so you don't want that. And it's flexible at this stage. You can move parts of it out of your way. And you'll be able to feel with your fingers whether or not you've got anything that feels kind of sharp. It's not sharp enough to cut you, but it's it's, it's uncomfortable. Just a nice little detail to take care, take that off. So that's good. So I'll get this cleared up. Okay, so the next thing to do then is to varnish it. And you're going to want to use a nice wide brush. Uh, the wider the better. Uh, you can get that varnish on without uh, over streaking and it seems to help with the brush strokes. Uh, I've said before I'm not a big fan of uh, varnishes for that reason, for brush strokes. Um, this Minwax I found was uh, the best at not leaving a whole lot of brush strokes. But uh, so here's here's my min wax, and I'll open it up, and as you can see, I actually I, ha I keep half of it in another jar. And one thing you want to do, whether it's varathane, min wax, or whatever, any type of varnish, is always, always, always stir it before you use it. Uh, there's lots of uh, binding agents in there that get separated, and uh, uh, one of the times I used used it before I realized that um, it stayed sticky and it never cured, and that was a reason. So once it's well stirred, that won't happen. So it doesn't matter what you use to to stir it with. So my brush has been slightly moistened, and I don't want gobs on, just, uh, actually I should have a piece of paper or something. Let's get this off here, just so that I don't have a, a whole lot on. Let's get that out of the way, okay, and then just brush it on. So I'm going to put two coats on. I'm going to do the edges also because they're, they've got pan pastels on them. And uh, let it dry thoroughly uh, in between coats. And after I put the second coat on, I'm going to bake it in the oven again for 30-35 uh, minutes, give or take, at about 225. So quite a bit lower than, uh, than I, I baked it uh, to cure it. So 
on the water. And so sometimes what I'll do is I'll sort of uh, put this on a couple of things and just sort of let it sit there until it's dry and that way it doesn't have to rest on anything. And um, when it's dry and all, all done, I'll be back. So my bracelet is cooling. Um, I uh, let it dry two hours in between each coat. I put two coats on and uh, after the second coat was dry I popped it in the oven and cured it at uh, 225 for about 35 minutes. So it's cooling right now and I thought I'll uh, really quickly talk about different types of stamps because you get a totally different effect depending on uh, on the type of stamp you have. So with the core roller it gives you a raised design that you can um, apply inks or paste or acrylic paints or whatever to. Most stamps that you buy like the ones you you know you buy on a on a board or something even texture mats will give you uh, a more of an impressed line look. So when you're using a stamp like that, and I have one here with a face on it, uh, you're coloring basically the outside and the impressed line doesn't get the color on it because you're just skimming over the surface. So that gives you a totally different look and that's quite a nice look too. Sometimes when you buy texture mats, like these are uh, best flexible mats, um, you can buy an any or an Audi design. So I have the same design here. One was called an any, one was called an Audi. So just really quickly, I'll press part of this into the clay. Just a small section. And do the same thing with the other design. Then when you color that with uh, a little pastel, you'll, you'll see more of that area is um, exposed the, or uh, colored than, than on the other design. So just totally different looks. So that's kind of important when you're doing uh, your stamp. And you can always just do a little test to see how it's going to look when you uh, color it. So anyways, as soon as this thing is uh, cool, I'll uh, put the hardware on and we're done. So I'll be right back. Okay, so this is pretty much uh, cool. Still a little bit soft because it's still a, just a, a bit warm. It's not too bad. So what I have here are two 10 millimeter uh, jump rings and they're fairly strong jump rings. And I have a magnet. Um, these ones I bought at a, a bead shop. Uh, it happened to be one that was fairly close to me. But you can, you can find them at different types of bead shops like Fire Mountain Gems. And uh, if you're in Canada, Bead Effects also sells them. And I have um, little tiny eyelets that I bought uh, in the scrapbooking department of Michaels. So... Um, First thing I'm going to do is glue the eyelets in place. So I've got my Gorilla Super Glue. This one might take me a little while to get it down because it's uh, it's getting really old and thick. But I've had it upside down, so I'm hoping it's going to come out fairly quickly. Well, that's not too bad. So I just get a little bit of glue on that. Okay, that's more than a little bit. <laughs> and then get the eyelid in there. I want to make sure that's no glue in the hole. Do the other side. And you can use a drill and open that up if it uh, if it ended up uh, being a little bit closed or something. But that's not bad. So I'm just going to clean that off.
That's great glue, Gorilla Glue, the super glue. So I got a couple pairs of jump ring or uh, chain nose pliers, rather. Um, these are big enough that you could use your hands and and hold one and use pliers only on one side. You've got to open these up quite a lot, so and open them sideways so you don't distort the the roundness of the the jump ring. Let's go with this one. Uh, ideally, you know, you'd let that sit for 10-15 minutes or something. And I've already gone ahead and put the small little five millimeter ring on the other end of the um, of the um, magnet. So I'll hold one end with one plier and the other end with the other plier and move my hands together. And I work it back and forth until it sort of uh, uh, work hardens a little bit and clicks in place. So that's one side done. And take that magnet off of there. Working with magnets is fun. Everything gets magnetized. If you have trouble putting it in, it needs to be open wider. These are big enough sometimes you can hold one side and instead of taking both pliers. Okay, that's not bad. And then it's closed. And I adjust the size um, by the size of the jump rings that I'm going to use. So if I found that this is too tight for me, then these little 5 millimeter jump rings, I'd be putting in 7 millimeter or 8 millimeter jump rings, uh, a different size. And, and that'll give me more space. But we'll try it. It's pretty much perfect. And uh, that's the bracelet. So uh, that's, that's how I make all of them um, with, like I say, variations depending on what surface I, I'm going to put on them. But um, I, I bake them like that, uh, bake them for a long time. If you do your bracelet and it snaps in half, um, possibly two, uh, one of two things went wrong. Uh, number one being it's either cured not long enough or... Um, at the wrong temperature and uh, even if you think you're set in your oven at you know let's say 275 for primo but uh, whatever temperature for your particular type of uh, clay uh, the oven tells you it's 275 but it's not really 275 so you need an oven thermometer to be absolutely sure and uh, once you get your oven working reliably you'll be so happy because uh, these are really really strong so uh, the other thing that can go wrong is uh, you need to condition the clay really well. So when I'm putting my clay in, um, you know, to, to get a condition, so let's say I'll fold it and put it with the fold side down. The next time I fold it, I might put the fold to the side and uh, flip it over, put it to the other side. And I'll do that 10, 15 times every time I condition it. And uh, that way, you know, the plasticizers that are in the clay is getting worked uh, throughout the clay in, in a more even way. Don't always put it in the same way. Um, it's good to, to uh, switch it up a bit. You don't really want to put the fold on the top because you might trap air. But uh, if, if you want to go that way, just flip it over. And then when you turn it upside down, you've changed the direction of it. Uh, that's a really great way of mixing your colors, too, because it mixes it way faster than uh, uh, any other method. So um, those are things that, c that can go wrong. But like I say, once you get it working the way you want it to work, um, uh, you'll be quite happy with it. And you can make uh, bangles the same way if you, uh, like on a pop can or something like that. Again, cook them for a long time. Uh, I don't make bangles for myself because I have a wide hand and a narrow wrist and they just look ridiculous on me. But um, that's why I like cuffs. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this uh, video. And if you did, give me a thumbs up, please. And um, I'll see you next time. Uh, if you want to um, 
make any suggestions for things you'd like to see, let me know. And if it's in my power to, uh, to show you, I will. If it's a technique that's developed by somebody else, um, then I won't be able to show you. But um, let me know anyways what you think you'd like. And uh, see you next time. Bye.